here this morning? Amen. 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 I don't think I've ever had that big a percentage of happy folks before. <laughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> but that's why you've done a good job. Thank Appreciate you. that, Lee. Couldn't have had a better subject for your uh, meddling. Appreciate that. And I hope everybody's had a good week. Uh, if you're here today and you are a believer and you've become a disciple and you have walked with him this week, you've had a good one. <coughs> you may not have had everything you wanted, when you wanted it, how you wanted it, but you still had a good week. Right. Amen. Amen. So anyway, 2 Thessalonians, if you'll join me there, chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians, I'm going to pick up reading uh, verse 3 again. You'll have it memorized. Sure. <laughs> Series from this first chapter has been entitled simply Why, W-H, Why, Why. We're going to have our fifth installment there today. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. We're bound to give, excuse me, thank God always for you, brethren, as it's meet. Because that your faith grows exceedingly, the charity of every one of you all toward each other abounds, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Let's pray together, if you will. Now, Lord, we count it a privilege, we count it an honor, we count it something, Lord, that we're not at all worthy of. Jason, Jacob said, I'm not worthy, God, of the least of your mercy, nor of the truth which you've shown me. That shoe fits our foot as well, God. We're not worthy, but we come asking just like Jacob did. He was in a bind, fixing to uh, confront someone, be confronted by someone he was afraid of. We don't have that particular scene in our future, at least that we're aware of, but we are, Lord, convinced that we need your Bible. We need for you to teach us again today more of your truth. We need for you, God, to make it as plain as it could possibly be so that we can incorporate your will in our lives. That's what all this is about. We thank you for the week we've just come through. We look forward to the week you're going to give us, if that's your plan. But God, we need you. We need your truth. We need to grow. We need to know how to do your will best. And that's our prayer here this morning, Lord. So use whatever means you will. Walk all the way around me. Don't let me get in your way. Don't let anything distract any of us. Please help us to focus on the text and to hear you plainly. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All God's folks said, amen. Amen. amen and amen. Again, this is our uh, fifth time, five out of six uh, messages at least planned for this first chapter, all of which entitled uh, Why. I've used this uh, title, series title, simply because, and you've heard it five times already before, I guess four times. In these first 12 verses, we have the answers to six particular question that would be asked by all disciples, I'm sure, at one time or another, and all of them have to do is why? Why? Why this God and why that? Last time we looked, beginning in verse 7, and saw that there's a day of rest coming uh, 
for disciples who were going through persecutions and tribulations. And we saw that it will be when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. We saw the answer to, if you will, question number four, why? Why is that going to be our day of rest? And this morning we've got question number five, if you will, that this coming vengeance, and that's kind of an old-fashioned word, but that this coming vengeance on a certain group of people will be well deserved. You'll find that in verse 8 and 9. Why is that? Why would it be well deserved? Well, first, let me just remind everybody again on this uh, word vengeance, it means vindication, retribution, uh, if you will, payback. So when Jesus returns, and this comes right from the text, and aren't you glad, y'all, we've got a Bible? <laughs> aren't you glad we don't have to rely on some kind of who knows what that me or any other uh, knucklehead could come up with and expect people to believe our dogma as if it meant something? Y'all, what I think is meaningless, absolutely meaningless. What the Word of God says, though, is whatever the opposite of the word meaningless would be. I'm going to pause here for just a minute. You know, Bill weren't here today, but Alex said, you could have come up here and sung. <laughs> and if you're good enough, we could have switched y'all out. You give, you take his job type thing. Don't tell him I said <laughs> Vengeance, payback, when Jesus returns with his mighty angels in flaming fire, verse 7 and 8, part of his mission in returning will be vindication, retribution. It will be the paying back of them, and I quote now, that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is both the who on this subject of payback, but it's also the why on the subject of payback. Why would God do this? And why would this be considered well-deserved? Well, now, obviously, y'all, this is not a pretty subject. And thank God that's not the only reason Jesus is coming back, right? Amen. He's coming back for the rest of the crowd, Amen. and that's going to be a big time. Amen. We won't even go there because I get started, it will be two and a half hours. But anyway, <laughs> it's not pretty, but nonetheless, it's the truth. I came up with some very spiritual illustrations to get me started here. Cleaning the bathroom is not pretty, but it needs to be done. True? Right. You men think, I have no idea. <laughs> you ladies are saying, oh, oh, that's right. How about this one? Cleaning the litter box is not pretty. But it needs to be done. True? Dog people don't know what I'm talking about. How about this one? Cleaning seafood. Shrimp, fish, crabs is not pretty, but it needs to be done. True? Unless you'd rather have a hamburger. Poof, right here. Okay, I'm getting tremendous response. <laughs> we live in a society, y'all, that demands tolerance. Tolerance. If I never knew the word in the last 10 years, I should have learned it. And that means tolerance of everything, everyone, every idea that anybody comes up with, no matter if it's right or if it's wrong or if it's some kind of screwball nonsense, we're supposed to accept it. We're supposed to tolerate it. We're supposed to buy it hook, line, and sinker. And if we don't, we're the bad guy. Everybody realize what's going on here? There's a new commercial that we've noticed on the Hallmark Channel. Who watches Hallmark Channel? Anybody? Just the old people. <laughs> and I'm not being funny there. It's got to be just old folks because the only thing they advertise is Depends and Medicine. <laughs> if you watch it, I'm telling the truth. Amen? Well, they got a new commercial, y'all. And uh, I don't remember what this, uh, this commercial, uh, the, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. It's a commercial for medicine. Okay, stop there. I don't remember what the medicine treated. It may be the botch. It may be a misplaced brain. It may be psychosis of the lumbago. But one of the side effects of this new medicine, and this is the truth, uh, is compulsive gambling. 
I'm telling you the truth. I, there are times when I fall asleep during the, uh, the show. And uh, in fact, she's a good one for that. She falls asleep in the middle of one plot and wakes up in the middle of another plot and then tries to put the two plots together. You ever tried that? You gotta be a genius to do that, but that's her. But this didn't happen. Compulsive gambling is a side effect of this new medicine. Now who buys that? I don't buy it, y'all. Listen, I don't mean to be uh, mean, cruel, critical, or anything else, but down in my innards, I know some scientist, I don't want to say doctor, because we may have one of them there, some scientist got a problem with gambling. And he come up with his medicine so he could tell his wife, it ain't my fault. I'm a victim. Anybody buy that? Well, if you can buy the first part, you ought to be able to buy the second part. They're both about as goofy. But tolerance has even become an issue in the church. So to keep folks from being offended, we've developed the habit of whitewashing the truth or watering down what's salty or sugarcoating what some folks feel like is ugly. Now, we do this because, well, you know, some folks don't believe like we do, and we need to be tolerant of their views. You ever remember the show Gong? Yeah. The Gong Show? We're going to get one of our deacons to get a long pole with a crook on it. Snatch me out of the pulpit when I say something's wrong. Look here. You all know it. I know it. That's the reason I'm preaching it. The Bible is God's book, not ours. Amen? Amen. The Bible is to be taken just as it is, not treated like a menu. A little of this, a little of that. The Bible... We in the Church of Christ, the Bible, we're to learn it, live it, preach it, never edit it. And if somebody balks at the truth that when Jesus returns to the earth in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not my job or your job to worry about offending folks or worry about popping someone's spiritual fantasy bubbles or tolerating other people's opinion. It's our job to be faithful to God's Word. Amen. I come across something, y'all, honest truth, just last night. It couldn't have been there before. Proverbs 16, 6. It must have just appeared last night because I ain't never noticed it before. By the fear of the Lord... Men depart from evil by the fear of the Lord. 16.6b, book of Proverbs, men depart from evil. So when we in the church refrain, soft step, pussyfoot with the word of God. Everybody here know pussyfoot? Are you familiar with that phrase? Yes, sir. If you got a cat, how, how in the world can them dudes do what they do with them little pads, you can't even hear them coming. Tommy talks like he don't even need a, a alarm clock. That Fuzzy Bridges over there just walks up to him with his little pads, not making any noise, bites his toe or does something, but wakes him up. <laughs> but the idea is that soft tread that a cat's got. We don't want no soft tread, y'all, when it comes to the Word of God. But when we start pussyfooting on the subject of Jesus paying people back, it's no wonder people don't fear God anymore. they got nothing to be afraid of. God's this big, uh, old, extremely old grandpa sitting up there in the sky somewhere. He just loves everything everybody does. He's just like a grandpa. And you men who are grandfathers, we got any grandfathers here today? And if you want to, you can raise one hand for every one of them you got. There are your hands everywhere. Listen, my guess is you didn't raise your children the way you raised them grandchildren. He gets him a crayon, or a, a, even better, a Sharpie, and draws flowers on the living room wall. Now, what would you have done 50 years ago when he tried that? You know, I know where you'd be. Yeah, bad or worse. Down at the funeral home. 
<laughs> I went in a paint store, you know, all some years back, and they were advertising in the Sherwin Williams store paint that you could wash off when your people, when your children write on the wall. Mm -hmm. My thinking was, my daddy didn't need that at his house. <laughs> If we wrote on the wall, we would already be unconscious. You don't write on walls, you write on paper. Why don't they spend some money teaching parents how to teach their children how not to write on the walls? Anybody remember days like that, y'all? In this world, gosh. We're living in a world where nobody hears about God Anything other than he's like a grandpa. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, that's so cute. I'm so glad they're doing that. Yo, he's coming to pay people back. Amen. But we get to pussyfooting on that thing. It's no wonder why uh, the fear of God just doesn't exist anymore. So anyway, here we go. Who is it that will receive the payback? Why is it they will receive the payback? Why is it that this payback will be so well deserved. Now the answer to all three of those questions is the same. They all three come from verse 8, chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians. Who? Them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Well, because they know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And why well deserved? Again, because they know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me explain. Characteristic number one, they know not God. Now, knowing God uh, is an expression that's coined right from the Bible that refers to a disciple's relationship with God. Now, rightly, uh, we should say, we would say, I'm coming to know God in the sense that we don't completely know Him. And my guess is, speculation is, throughout all eternity, we'll never completely know Him because He's infinite in every one of His characteristics. So we're coming to know Him, if you will. We're learning our God. Uh, one could say, I know God better now than I did 10 years ago, uh, if you will. Knowing God, uh, generally something that the disciple realizes in what you might call the rearview mirror of life. In other words, when something's behind you, when time has passed. In other words, you come to Christ. Uh, you become a disciple. You're continuing in His Word, John 8, 31. You start to desire His Word. Second, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. You find yourself beginning to hunger and thirst for His ways, Matthew 5, 6. You find yourself, in a picture, panting. Uh, for the presence of God like a running deer does in the forest. Psalm 42, 1. You realize that at times you're actually thirsty for God. Psalm 42, verse 2. You're developing the habit of daily being in what Jesus himself referred to as the closet of prayer with him. Matthew chapter 6, 6. And then one day... You hear what uh, can might, you might could call some strange new doctrine. And you don't have to look for those things very hard these days. They pop up way too often. Some strange new doctrine. Or you hear someone say something about God that doesn't line up with the Bible. Or you hear some related spiritual experience that they've had, but one that's never found in the Bible. Now deep down inside, you know better. You may not be able to argue that old boy or that old girl on that point, but you know something about that thing just ain't right. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? It's like walking in a room. Uh, I, I use a, a shop, a wood shop, for some of the work that I do, and there's always certain smells in a wood shop. 
and a strange smell instantly shows up. I mean, you instantly realize that. So you hear, you see, whatever the case is, but you know better because you're coming to know God. And that means that you're starting to, to you, you've been introduced and you're daily coming to know a little bit more about what it says of him in here. Amen. You know it. You know it. You hear somebody this week, I, I'll just pick on Alex because I can see him over there. I won't pick on Sarah if she'll hit me. Well, boy, that Alex, he's quite a singer. You know, he sings in the choir every Sunday over at Our Banks Baptist. And some per people might say, well, sure, why not? I mean, he looks kind of like Frank Sinatra. Why wouldn't he be in the choir? <laughs> but if you know Alex and if you know our choir, wait a minute, that ain't right. He may be singing, and he may look like Frank Sinatra, uh, but I know better. If somebody says thus and such about the Bible says, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. No, it don't. And won't he, you know, got through the Bible a time or two, you think either somebody tore a page out or somebody's making something up. And so, I, I use those illustrations, uh, hopefully, uh, to suggest the thought to you, we really do know our God, but it really is a time process. Amen. And you can't sit over here in your Bible over yonder, you can't be one of them cats that never comes to church and say, well, I know God. You probably don't if you're not in your Bible. Because that's where it comes from. Anybody here, uh, any of you husbands, uh, would you make a statement like this? I completely know everything there is to know about my wife. No. That's some smart men in there. How about which of you husbands, though, would say, could say, I know my wife better now than I did 10 years ago? Anybody? They ain't going to get mad about that. That's the way it works, y'all. In my house, I get surprised every once in a while. Anybody? I ain't going to tell you why. She's looking at me like, please don't tell me. <laughs> I, I don't ever say nothing about my wife. You know that. That's a time thing, y'all. It's a time thing. Well, anyway, when 2 Thessalonians 1.8 then speaks of them that know not God, it's speaking of a man, a woman, a young person who has chosen, made the choice not to give God his due. Right. Okay? That's bottom line right there. God is not uh, an an option. Many folk feel that he is, but there won't four gods that created the universe, y'all, right. no matter who says what. We've made the decision that the word, the Bible, is the word of God. And so everything we believe about spirituality comes from the Bible, and it don't tell us there were four gods in the beginning that created the heaven and the earth. Uh, one God, three persons, that's our God. Plain, simple, this is our vantage point. People say, well, I don't agree with that. It don't make any difference to me. You can believe anything you want. I can believe anything you want. But this is where we're coming from. Right. People say, man, you are not talk like that. Well, maybe not, but for the fact that I believe the Bible. That's why I'm for this and again that. Because of this. Amen. Just that simple. Thank God for it. So anyway. People say, well, wait a minute. Are you telling me that this not knowing God is simply because I've chosen not to know God? Bingo. Mm -hmm. That's it. No matter what you call it or who you choose to serve else, this is what it boils down to. You've chosen not to give your life to Him, your obedience to Him, your submission to Him, your respect to Him, what he is due, you've chosen, I've chosen, anybody who won't know him, doesn't know him, has chosen. That's the thing that's happened. And we've not seen him in his glory, obviously, except by faith in his word. But the day's coming when we will. We're going to see him, y'all. We're going to see him. And on that day, we'll realize better than ever before that those who refused to know him 
deserved his payback because he's God. Just that, you remember, and I don't mean to always be negative, you remember when all it took was being a dad and you were respected? You had to earn nothing. You remember when our elected officials, this may, you may have to go back a while for this one, but they were given due respect because of the character of people that they were. Our law enforcement people got respect just because of their uniform like our military folks. Y'all, that's a pitiful way to introduce this, but our God, similarly though, higher than the heavens above that, deserves every decision that every human will ever make just because He's God. Right. Those that don't know Him are those that have chosen not to know Him. And all are free to do so, but it's not a good idea. Characteristic number two, they that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who are they? Uh, who will be those rather? Well, they'll have vengeance taken on them. Why? Will they have vengeance taken on them? Why is this vengeance going to be well deserved? Because they obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus. You know all these things, not telling you nothing you don't know. But obey is not a popular word today, uh, no matter what the subject. But as unpopular as it may be, here it is on the subject of the gospel. Obey the gospel. Obey the gospel. Now, in one sense, and, and please don't take offense at this, I pray, we do an injustice to people uh, when we use the phrase in the church, invitation hymn. Invitation hymn. Now, granted, the reason that we do, we all know. We use that expression. That's the hymn we have at the very last of our service. Now what we're doing is inviting people to come do their business with God right here, right now. I heard Billy Graham say one time, somebody was uh, bragging on his preaching. He said, I'm not a good preacher. He says, I've never presumed that I was. He said, but I do know how to give an altar call or an invitation. And if you've ever watched one of his... Uh, Services, one of I'm trying to think of the uh, what he used to call his crusades. Crusade. That's the word I'm looking for. In fact, we had a movie uh, last month that had uh, one of his crusades uh, portrayed in that movie. And I don't mean to be disrespectful, no, a thousand times no, but that man knew how to give an invitation. He announced what he was going to do, he announced what he expected people to do. In fact, According to the film, while he's still introducing that the invitation's about to happen, people have already gotten up and started coming down that way because three, he had folks, my word not his, seated, S-E-E-D-E-D, -E -E in the audience, uh, his workers that were in every possible piece of that coliseum or whatever, uh, that would come towards the altar during invitation time to give lost people somebody to walk with. I mean, it's a long way even down this short island. you got to go by yourself, amen? But some other believer decides to just get up and give a little bit of comfort to that one who's having trouble coming by themselves, and it works. It helps people. So here they are flocking down there, and then he gives the invitation, which is, look, I want you to come. I want you to stand here before me. I'm going to have a few remarks to you off the camera, off the microphone, and I'm going to tell you exactly what I want you to do. And that's to embrace the Christ of the Bible wholeheartedly. So we have invitation hymns to ask people to come. Do it now. Don't put it off. Do it right now. But, having said all that, the bottom line is, y'all, God has never invited anyone to the gospel. It's a command. I mean, we all remember, uh, obviously, uh, Matthew 11, 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Who said that, y'all? Jesus said it. The Lord himself said it, take my yoke upon you. 
and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you will, as I close this thing up, number one, he gives us a command with a promise. A command with a promise. Notice he doesn't say, I invite you. If you get a chance to. If you would be willing to. Uh-uh. Come. 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 Come unto me, all ye that labor. And here's the promise. I'm going to give you rest. I've never known anyone come to the Lord that a part of what the burden of their soul was, was a lack of rest. They weren't at peace. And they can have all the money they want, all the toys they want, all the friends they want, all the everything they want, but on the inside, what they're looking for is some peace. You've been there. I've been there. Jesus says, I got it. Come to me, and you can find peace. That's the command with promise. Second will, if you will, the practi uh, practicalization of the command with the promise. It's as if he puts uh, the command uh, in a word picture. Take my yoke on you. Yeah, I don't know much about that kind of farming. If it ain't a tiller or a hoe, I don't know nothing about it. But a yoke is this apparatus that you can hook up two animals side by side, and they can pull the load. They can pull the plow, if they had them in those days, pull a disc. They can pull a cart, pull a buggy, pull your wife, whatever the case needs to be. But it's an apparatus that you fit around their neck. They couldn't get out of it. Jesus said, I want you to take my yoke and I want to put it on you so I can stand behind you with the reins. And I don't know anything about the reins on a yoke either, but I know you can pull a rein and snap a rein one way or another way and it directs the animal, the ox, the cow, the whatever. Uh, I was with one old boy one day and had a mule hooked up out there, and he could make noises with his mouth, and the mule knew what the noise meant. He says, just do such and such, and the mule will do so and so. Well, I couldn't do such and such, not like him. The mule just stood there. I was in a rascal. I you know, made the noise again, you know, or whatever it was. The mule said, man, you didn't even get this job done. But here Jesus says, look, this is, this is how it works. You, he didn't say, let me put my yoke on you. you got to do it. I've got to submit my life to him and let him start controlling the reins. And there's the promise. You'll find rest to your soul. It's as if Jesus is hung up on this thing. I can give you rest. How many of you here have tasted? He gives you rest. Amen. And a day goes by in my life, you, nor yours, that we don't taste this thing rest. <laughs> and all hell can be breaking loose around us, but on the inside, we just know it's going to be all right. How many times have I told my wife, and how many times has she told me, no matter what, it's going to be all right. And it always is. The command with the promise, the practicalization of the command with a promise, and then finally the, the appraisal, if you will, of the, of the command of the, with the promise. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now this is what all people are commanded to do. This is exactly how the command is to be done, and this is exactly what obeying the command will produce. Bottom line, anyone who's not living the gospel is simply telling Jesus, no. No. Not trying to be wise. How many of you were in the habit of telling your daddy and your mama no? <laughs> Can you imagine? You know, this is back in the days when moms and dads spunked you. That's plural for spunk. <laughs> you got whoopers. You went to the woodshed. Remember? And, you know, it's funny how that thing works. What a coincidence you find it in the Bible. They didn't have to do that every day in your life. I mean, even if you're sharp as a tack like me, it didn't take but like, you know, 30 or 40 whoopings to realize, I don't believe I'm going to do that no more. <laughs> Woo! If we could just get that thinking back spiritually into the church. Listen, someone who's not obeying the gospel is telling Jesus what you came to do? No. Nope. What you lived and died for? No. Nope. 
What you've commanded all men everywhere to do? We don't see it. I'm thinking one day at least we'll understand it better. There he hangs on the cross, y'all, his life dripping out of him, one drop at a time. He hung there for six hours. He had been abused for nine hours. He had a gash in his side and thorns pressed down uh, into his head, his forehead, the back of his head. He, he just hung there giving up all that he was for one reason. For every single man, woman, and young person that ever lived. That's all. And so Paul says, look here, he's coming back, not knowing him, not obeying the gospel, is simply telling him no. Nothing more, nothing less. This is the why. It's going to be well deserved. Again, this is ugly stuff. I realize that it is. Only if you make the wrong decision. Look, you're here this morning and you've never given Jesus your everything. And by the way, that's all he ask. You can't give him half. You can't give your wife half and get, what, get away with it. Amen? You can't give your children half and expect them to grow up. Let it count at all. And Jesus only asks one thing. All of you. If you've never done that today, you know what the Bible calls that. May I remind you, you can change that right here, right now. Lord, yes. Yes, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, you're the only one that can do any persuading. My guess is most, if not all, here today, we've tasted, we've experienced that persuading. And oh, what a precious thing it was. What a precious thing it is. Lord, be there someone teetering on the verge today. <coughs> Whether or not to live for you. Please persuade. Please convince. Please make that one and me hear the promise. Rest. Rest on the inside. Father, please do. We pray in your name. As our group sings, I'm going to ask you to continue praying. If you're here today, God spoke to you. Thanks.